Now, what we're going to study today, much easier to see if I turn that on, is called Fraunhofer diffraction. Fraunhofer is a dude. Fresnel was another dude. Fresnel worked out the problem for diffraction when you're close to the, the slit stuff. Fraunhofer worked out the diffraction when you're far from it. The Fraunhofer diffraction is the easy one. That's what we're doing. So Fraunhofer diffraction is, quote, far field diffraction. And what we were viewing was far field because the distance from our grading to the screen we were observing was very long compared to the separation between the slits. That's what defines far field. And we'll see further how that geometry is important. So I'm going to start by talking about the double slit. In my demonstration, I start with the single slit because I think it makes more sense observing the phenomenon to start with a single slit. But it's the easiest to understand doing the double slit first. So that's why the order is swapped here from the demonstration versus the explanation. And the picture is showing multiple slits instead of just two. It does make a difference, as you saw. But the diffraction we're seeing is the result of Huygens' principle. What, did, what was Huygens' principle? Every point on a wavefront acts like, like a new wave source. So if I have a wave coming and meeting these slits, one of the things we're starting out with is a coherent wave. Coherent meaning that the waves are all in phase at the same time here. So I have wave fronts shown with, I think that's blue. If I was wearing my glass, I'd probably be able to tell you for sure. Um, those blue parallel lines are the wave fronts. The orangish arrows are the directions traveling. And they get here to the slits. And each slit now is going to behave like a point source because of Huygens' principle. And so we have light coming out of each slit going in all directions. Now, what's drawn is only the light that hits certain points on the screen. But just keep in mind, there's light going in all directions, and only the interesting rays have been shown. And so this point here is the point where we have ray 1 from each one of the slits got to that point. And so if we have light from multiple places that come to the same point, it's going to interfere. And it could interfere constructively or destructively. Now, when the light was going through the slits, it was all in phase. If somehow magically I had all those slits at the same point, would it have been constructive or destructive at that point? It would have been constructive. But because it was different distances for each of those rays, it's not necessarily going to be constructive now. And so what we have to do is we have to just consider how much did the phase change along each path. Now in the lab today, I will explain this in the simplistic fashion. You guys get the complicated explanation. Why? So you can understand it better. So... <clears throat> A first step is this picture right here, which illustrates the far field of Fraunhofer approximation. The far field approximation is that the screen is so far away compared to the separation between the slits that the rays of light that are going from your slit to your screen are so close to parallel that we can just treat them as parallel rays. Now, of course, if they were truly parallel, they would never meet, right? But it's an approximation. You're like, you know, 89.992 degrees or something. <laughs> well, that would be 0 0.008 is what I meant to indicate degrees between the two lines. Um, so we're going to treat them as effectively parallel. I'll show you where that angle I was thinking of came from. It was this angle right here. Those angles, instead of being exactly 90, would really be something like 
you know, 89.992 or something like that. So we're just approximating that those are true right angles there. And so if that's true, then we have these parallel rays that are going to all meet at the same place. And so the difference in their paths is only going to be this distance right there. That's going to be the path length difference delta L. Going from this line, because it's, quote, perpendicular to the rays that are going to the same point, it's going to be the same distance. That's our approximation. So with that approximation, we can just use geometry and say that if D right here, that D is the distance between two adjacent slits, then the difference in path length between the two adjacent slits is this delta, which is just D sine of whatever this angle theta is. But then we have to figure out what is that angle theta. To figure out that angle theta, we just look here and we say, hmm, this picture is not a far field picture. What tells you it's not a far field picture? Yeah, the lines don't appear to be parallel. And this distance here is not extreme compared to this distance here. So this picture is not a far field picture because they wanted to put it all on one page instead of having it on 27 pages. So we have to take some, some understanding into this picture and say, okay, essentially all of these slits are really at one point here and the angle theta is the same as the angle from the center of my slits to where I observed. And so you see this marked as theta here for the viewing angle. That angle theta is the angle between the normal to the slits and the rays. If we look at this blow up triangle, this is this angle here is the angle between the normal to the rays and the um, perpendicular, well, and the slit. So this is, this is perpendicular to, I got, this side here is perpendicular to this side, and this side here is perpendicular to this side. And thus the angle between the perpendiculars is the same as the angle between the originals. And so they're the same angle, which gives me a simple equation. Okay, so this is the simple form. The difference in path length is equal to d sine theta. And if it's going to be constructive interference, what did we learn in class yesterday? That, that was the destructive one. That is one of the two we learned in class yesterday, though. So if it's constructive, it's going to be m lambda. And it'll be equal to what she said, m plus 1 half lambda for destructive. That is, the waves will be in phase, so one wavelength difference in their path lengths, two wavelength difference, still in phase, if it's constructive. Exactly a half wavelength out of phase for destructive. Now, the hard way. The hard way, the one that gives you a better understanding of what's going on and sets us up for the double slit um, derivation, which you can really only kind of do a hand-waving argument for without... Um, without ideas of calculus, even though we won't do a true integral. We're going to do graphical integration. You whenever, well, you've not done graphical integration like this. So we have the electric field because the electromagnetic waves are what light is. So the electric field is oscillating. You know, E is equal to the peak electric field times sine of omega t, where omega is just the angular frequency. So we have the electric field that's oscillating. The first time I wrote it, I put plus a phase angle. But we'll just make life easy and set 
phi equal to zero and have our light coherent so they all have the same phi and we don't have to worry about that. So this is the electric field coming to our slits. Now, because we have different paths, we're going to have different times it takes for the light to go from the slit to the screen. And so the time that it takes depends on the difference in path length. So that delta T is the time difference or the time it takes to go from the slit to a given point on the screen. And so if I put that into my equation that E was equal to E ot sine of omega T, I say my time is actually T plus this change in time. Then I have my electric field when it hits the screen is this equation that has a time dependent part and a length dependent part. So it takes longer to get there if it has to travel a larger distance. Because it had to travel a larger distance, that means you're going to be a different phase in the wave. So the total electric field, if I have two slits, is going to be the electric field from one slit plus the electric field from the other slit. And so I can write that electric field is equal to E ot sine of the one from the first slit would be omega t plus 2 pi length 1. Length 1 is the distance from the slit 2. Now slit 1 to the point plus the same exact thing, but it has length 2, the distance from slit 2 to the same point. So if we were to look at our picture, go back three slides, it's like saying, okay, here is slit 1, here is slit 2. And so length one is the distance of this, and length two is the distance of that. Then we have a second form, and this one simply requires the utilization of a trigonometric identity. Now, if you're like me, you don't remember most of your trigonometric identities. And so the one we're using here is sine of A plus sine of B is equal to 2 sine of A plus B cosine of A minus B. Oh, I forgot over 2s for these two. So that's, that's a trigonometric identity. It's not something that I'm going to sit here and prove, right? That's something that I don't know, we probably learned it first in high school, and then again, like in, well, I didn't take college algebra, so yeah, in high school, but if you took college algebra, or if you took pre-calculus, another class I didn't take, you know, you would have had it come there. Math education was a little different back in my day. We just, you know, jumped right into calculus. So, yeah, I'm so old. <laughs> Why do we use this form? This form is easier to do the next step with. Right? Because you look at it, you're like, well, well, they're equivalent. Why would you do that? There, there's a reason the next step. The next step is to go from the electric field to the intensity. So intensity is equal to the power per unit area. Power is energy per time. So this is the energy per time times area. That's what intensity is. And I better put energy here so we don't get it confused with E for electric field. Now it turns out that the intensity is proportional to the electric field squared. Now, I put absolute value squared. That technically means mod squared. Um, that's a holdover habit from quantum mechanics that you'll learn soon enough. So the intensity is proportional to the electric field squared. So that means that my electric field squared would be equal to, and if I look at this, that'd be... E0 squared times 2 squared is 4 <laughs> times sine squared of omega t plus pi times L2 plus L1 
over lambda, then cosine squared of pi times L2 minus L1 over lambda. So there's what my electric field squared looks like. So my intensity should be proportional to that. Now, what would the intensity be if I had just the light that went to, through the two slits combined together? What would I have then? Not, not with different paths, but with the same path length. Just theorem. It'd be what? Just the equation theorem. Well, it is that, but using the electric field. What would the electric field be if I had just the two slits and no path length difference? I, I, I mean in terms of this equation stuff here. Well, in, oh, wait, you said E hat squared. I, I thought you said P. I thought you were saying P the whole time. Were you saying E I the first time too? Okay. Okay, so the second time, we're getting closer. It's not E hot squared because of a little definition. The E hot is the electric field amplitude going through one slit. But if I have two slits, then I have a total of two E hot. I square that and that'd be four E hot squared. And so what I can do now is say that my intensity. over intensity I is equal to this Right, so that's my intensity. Of course, you know what the fact is? We don't care about the instantaneous intensity. When you were looking at the screen, your eyes were doing an averaging process. Right, you didn't see things flickering because the frequency here is on the order of gigahertz and your eyes can't see the flicker in the gigahertz. And so all we care about is the average. So now let's take the average intensity if I average sine squared of omega t plus the other stuff what do I get what's the average of a sine squared as a function of time Let's start with the simple thing. If it was sine, what's the average of sine over one period? Zero, because it, has, it goes from zero up to one, down to minus one, and back to zero. So over one period, the average is zero. Now, if I do sine squared, it doesn't go from minus one to one. What does it go from? Sine squared. From zero to one. And so if I go through one period, one period of the original, it actually goes from zero to its peak to zero to its peak to zero. It goes through two peaks, but the average was symmetrical between one and zero, which makes it one half. So the average of the sine term is just one half. And then I have the second term, cosine squared of pi times L2 minus L1 over lambda. Well, now I need to determine what that L2 minus L1 is. So I can get this in terms of the viewing angle. But we actually already did that because we saw from the picture where we described the far field approximation equals and the, the width or the separation of slits was D, and then it was sine theta. I'll go, maybe, go back to the picture here just to review on, uh, zoom in. Can't zoom on this slide now, which means something's going to crash soon. But you can see down here at the bottom, that difference in length was D sine theta. You can't see it. 
you can't I, i'm oh hey look now it worked okay maybe it won't crash so it was that so putting this together now we have and i'm to the bottom of the page i average is equal to i ought average over two times cosine squared of pi d sine theta over lambda. And that's ought average there. Zoom in so it's legible. <laughs> While I'm zoomed in, let's make that average look like AVG as well. And so there's our equation for the intensity at any angle. It depends on cosine squared of pi d sine theta over lambda. Now, I have a difference of one half between what I just did and what I have there. I got it when I was preparing as well, and I tried to figure out why I had a difference, and I frankly can't remember why I had a difference. Fortunately, that really doesn't affect us. What we care about is where do we have the maxima? Where do we have the minima? And the intensity at the maxima, according to this equation, is going to be constant for each one. So how do I find where a maximum or minimum occurs with this equation? There's actually a much easier way. You're right. That would work. But there's a much easier way. Yeah. When the argument of cosine squared is an integer multiple of pi, it's at a maximum. Right, because cosine squared of 0 is 1, cosine squared of pi is minus 1 squared, or 1. Cosine squared of 2 pi is 1. Those are the maximum values you can get for cosine. So what I did here is I did do the derivative because we know the behavior of cosine. It would have worked perfectly if I had done the derivative. It just would have taken more time. So that's the maximum. What about for minimum? Right. If you are at one half pi, pi over two, then cosine is zero. If you're at three pi over two, cosine is zero. And so we have these pretty simple relations now to get where the maximum and minimum occur. So doing the first one, actually, I should have given myself some spacing. Great. So doing the first one, just we have pi on both sides, so I can cancel that pi and then solve it. I just multiply the lambda across. I say d sine theta equals m lambda is my condition for maxima. Right, that last step was some of the easiest math you'll ever see, right? Just multiply both sides by m, or excuse me, by lambda. Well, for minimum, I'll do the same thing, divide by pi's, multiply by lambda. d sine theta is equal to m plus one half lambda. So there's the equation to give us the spacing between maxima and or between minima for a double slit. So when I had the double slit, remember we had a broad range that had light. It's kind of hard to pinpoint where the maxima are. But where it goes to zero is pretty easy to pinpoint. And so we often spend more time focusing on that. Or we'll talk about what's the width of the central peak. Well, the width of the central peak is going to be going from minimum on one side to minimum on the other side. Now let's spend just a moment remembering what does M stand for in these two equations? 
Yeah. Any random integer could be positive, could be negative. And so you're going to have a pattern that repeats symmetrically on the left side versus the right side. It's going to have um, at the center, you have um, a maximum. And then as you move out, you have your first minimum on each side, and your second minimum and so on. And so if they ask what's the, you know, the width of the central peak, well, you'd find the angle for the first minimum on one side. And by symmetry, it's the same for the first minimum on the other side. That gives you the angle. And then using the distance to the screen, you could convert it to actual distance if you needed to. Question. So the angle is those two together? The angle's on either side? Okay. So, so let me draw a picture. Here's – forgot. Different program. You have to do it differently. Here's my double slip. And then I'm going to have a viewing screen out here. And once again, based on my sizes, you'd say, well, this is a near field picture because I can't make a far field picture fit on one screen. And so now if we look at the pattern of light produced, the pattern of light, there's the center point. The pattern of light is going to be going like this. And so we have... The central peak here, um, <laughs> my picture actually looks more like a single slit. I got to do it again. I can't, I can't leave it looking like a single slit for the double slit. It should have a maximum here. Let's say maximum there, maximum there. Those spacings should be equal. And then the minimum spacings, well, they're equal if you do it in terms of angle. The minimum spacing should be halfway in between. So now I'm going to have a peak here. A minimum here, peak here, minimum there, peak here. So it looks something like this. And so you have the M's for the minima are going to be something like 1, 2, 0, minus 1. All that matters is they're offset. The actual center comes between zero and one in this numbering system, which doesn't bother me. And the peaks for the maxima are gonna be zero, one, minus one, minus two. And so there's the M values for the different maxima and minima. So if it asks you what's the width of the central peak, right, getting to now what the question was. Now I can find the angle and I'm gonna have The same angle on each side there. So I'm just going to put theta 1 and theta 1 for, for D, or actually theta 1 and theta 0, shouldn't it? Because it's going to the destructive ones. But theta 1 and theta 0 are going to be the same angle, just on opposite sides. So the total angle there for the central peak is 2 theta 0 or 2 theta 1, since they're the same value, um, except for one's negative. I think you can deal with the negative sign. And then if I want to top, find the linear distance, I would use tangent. I'd say take two tangent of D, or two D tangent of theta one for the minimum. Just for where D, or <laughs> has to be careful. Let me call this capital L. And so the width is equal to two because you have two right triangles and each one has L sine theta one for the opposite side, or not sine, tan. For small angle approximation, tan and sine are the same, but even with the Fraunhofer diffraction where you're in the far field, your viewing angles don't have to be small angles. And so it's always safer to put in tangent. You'll find some books that will actually just say, and theta 1 is approximately equal to tangent theta 1. And then they'll substitute in the equation we have there, since sine theta is approximately tangent small angle, and just say, you know, theta 1 is equal to m plus 1 half um, lambda over d, which is correct if your angle is less than about 5 degrees. But if it's more than that, it becomes incorrect. So it's safer to put it this way. 
Okay, did I answer your question, Aaron? Okay, well, the, um, I will add a, I can't wait until they fix this bug. Right. It doesn't make sense that you have to go through the insert process twice to insert a page. Okay, so we have a triangle. Here is the length from the slits to the screen. And this side here is one half the width of central peak. And this angle here was theta one using the minimum equation. And so what relates that one half of the central peak with the length L opposite and adjacent is tangent. And so I had, and so I'm going to call this equals one half W to make life easy. So tangent of theta one min is equal to one half that width the central peak over L opposite over adjacent. And then I just solved it for, for the width. All righty. That is our double slit derivation. One thing that this did not have was any variation in intensity as we go out. The equation just said the intensity is going to remain the same for every dot. That's not right. They do get fainter as you move out. So there's something we're missing, and we have to do the single slit before we can put back in the thing that's missing. So, oh my goodness. We have 12 minutes left in class. I've been going not fast. So now we go to the single slit problem. The single slit problem is the harder one. And we do this problem by using the phaser idea. Now remember in, in electric circuits, we introduced phasers when we had inductors and capacitors. It's the same idea here of a phaser, but now we're talking about the phase of light, which actually makes a lot more sense than when we talked about it with electricity. The phase of light means you have a phase angle that's different. That is a different time when you're at a peak. And so we're going to take a single slit and break it up into capital N virtual slits. Right? We're not putting in something that's actually breaking into slits. We're breaking into virtual slits for addition. Now, if this was not a calculus-based class, I would have N is a finite number of slits. And then I would have to add up each one of those finite slits and find what the total electric field is when I add each one of those individual slits up. Now, with the calculus class, we can make the slits infinitesimal, and then we can integrate them. We're not going to do the actual integration. If you were to make it so as infinitesimal, you would have each of these little phasers is a vector. Well, let's start with, let's make it simple and say we broke it into three slits. If we broke into three slits, we would have something like phaser one goes like this, phaser two goes like this, and phaser three goes like that. And then we would add the three phasers together. And what do you get when you add the phasers together? How, how do we add vectors? Tip to tail. So I drew it in tip to tail. And so how would I find the result? Starting point to ending point. So that would be a non-calculus version of doing this, adding it up. This was only with three slits. Now, of course, with only three slits, it wouldn't have added up correctly, right? You would have too much error because of the approximation. But if you break it into an infinite number of slits, you're still doing the same thing. You have an infinitesimal D electric field vector plus the infinitesimal d electric field vector, and you're adding them all up. And then when you add them all up, the sum 
is going to be going from where you started to where you ended. So we're going to do a graphical, a geometric integration. We're not even going to write an integral sign. We're just going to use the fact that if I have electric fields with differing phases and I add them all together, the resultant is that right there. So now, how do we do this? Well, first we have to break it up. So we have a total electric field going through the whole first slit, the whole single slit, that's E0. And so for each of our virtual slits, it's E0 divided by capital N, where capital N is the number of slits. Excellent. I never even have my ringer on. Sorry, Nate, I'm in class. Um, can't be good, right? <laughs> so we have each slit has an electric field that's 1 over n times the total electric field. And then we have sine of omega t plus phi. And we have a slightly different phase angle depending on how far we are. Now, just like before, in the far field approximation, I'm going to have a difference in length that is just increasing linearly as I move across the slit. And so the change in phase is, well, here we have, whoops. I'm going to change to one that's non-permanent. How's that? Here we have the length for the nth virtual slit. That is the distance from the, the length from here to the screen for each slit changes something is permanent. And if we want to be all tricky about that, we will take this triangle and say, well, the maximum out here is a delta L max is equal to the width of the slit. And the symbol I'm using for the width of the slit in my work is a lowercase a. So A sine of theta. And then we're going to convert that into an angle. Up in the top, this has phi. In my equation, I used beta. So where it says phi, that's the same thing as beta. That beta is taking this distance difference in length and converting it to the difference in phase angle that's going to produce. So the difference in phase angle is going to be um, delta L max times, and I just have the uh, 2 pi over lambda that you see right here. So that's where the beta definition comes in. It's the difference in phase that results from the delta, the changes in L. So we put that in, and now we have our final, the electric field through each slit has this value. And now we just have to add these little boogers up. Hmm. To add this all up. Well, we know that the length of the arc going from the bottom to the top. Actually, let me go to the next picture because the next picture is more illustrative. The length going from here to here along the arcing path is the total electric field, right? Because initially we had just a flat thing with all that electric field coming through. And this distance going from starting point to ending point it's marked with the E subscript theta zero. That's the electric field for the fit, for the angle that we're viewing. And if those two were equal in length, if the red arc was the same length as the blue line, not possible, but if they were the same length, then I'd have the original intensity because I'd have the same electric field strength. Well, now we just, just use geometry to calculate what each one of these are. Notice the picture has a radius R. I don't know and I don't care what that radius is. 
all I have to do is take my geometry and I know that an arc length relates to the radius and the angle. What's the relationship between the arc length and the radius? Change color. E zero is the arc length. Right, it's the radius times the angle. So that's gonna be my radius R, I don't know its value, times the angle going from here to here. Well, that total angle is beta, right? The maximum difference in angle. So that's what E zero is in terms of R that I don't know. Now let's do the harder calculation e theta zero. Now, if we look at this, let's break e theta zero into two pieces. So this part of a triangle is one half e theta zero. Don't know why that popped up. Well, my finger must hit the wrong thing. That's a half angle with the hypotenuse being r. What trigonometric function relates the hypotenuse with the opposite side? Sine. So from my picture, I can say that sine of the half angle, so sine of beta over two, is equal to the opposite side, which is one half e theta zero, divided by the hypotenuse, which is r. So if I want to solve that for e theta zero, I just multiply both sides by two r. And finally then, I get e theta zero over e zero is equal to two r sine of beta over two divided by r beta, or we usually write this, notice the r's, what are they gonna do? Cancel. That's good, because I did not know those values. We usually write this as sine of beta over two divided by beta over two. Now that was the ratio of the electric fields. How's that gonna to relate to intensity? Yes, intensity is proportional to the electric field squared. Therefore, intensity theta over intensity initial is just gonna be equal to sine squared of beta over two over beta over two quantity squared. Now we have an intensity function that varies with beta. And beta was equal to two pi times the slit width over the wavelength times sine of our viewing angle. So the final equation here Um, no, because it because I is proportional to E squared. Oh. So there's the equation for the intensity as a function of angle. Now you have something that is a function of theta divided by a function of theta. It's going to have a, a magnitude that changes as angle increases. There's a couple things we have to look at. I'm going to go to the next page. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. What is the symbol next to phi? A. Oh, okay. Better? Yes. So here it's written out. <laughs> in a readable form for you, um, except for one, yes. It, it means the same thing. I put a square here and a square here. And here when I wrote it in, I put the square over the whole thing. It means the same thing. So now we have an equation that varies with intensity. And notice the numerator, at what angles is sine theta gonna be zero?
okay, at angles that are integer multiples of pi, right? So we're going to have the top has, um, okay, that, that's actually, yeah, that's correct. So at theta equals zero, at theta equals pi, this here is going to be zero. And when this whole thing is an integer multiple of pi, then this sign is going to be zero. Notice the sign and the sign. Oh, did I write? I did write that with a sign. Yeah, I did. Okay. Just want to make sure I had the sign and the sign. So it's, it's more complicated than it seems. Because as theta changes, sine theta changes, and you need zero minimum when pi a sine theta over lambda is equal to m pi. So that gives us that a sine theta is equal to m lambda. Same work we did before. In fact, we've seen this equation before, except for if you look at this equation before, instead of an a, it had a d. And what was this equation for last time we looked at it? It was for constructive. But now it's for destructive because that's when it's the minimum. Look at the numerator. So we have constructive where we had destructive before. And what should we have when theta is zero? If M is zero, theta is going to have to be zero. So this predicts destructive interference at the center. But we did not see that with the single slit here. So there's something more going on. Who can see what else is going on? We're dividing by sine theta. When theta is zero, we're dividing by zero. That's not legit, right? So what we have to do is use L'Hopital's rule. Now, because I'm already three minutes over, I won't apply L'Hopital's rule. But we find that it turns out that it's actually a maximum at this angle. So m equals minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, skip 0, 1, 2. So m is any non-zero integer for the minima. How do you find the maxima? This time, we have to do exactly what Gabriel told us. We have to take the derivative and set the derivative equal to zero to find the maxima. Because we have a changing numerator and a changing denominator, it's not just going to be where the term on top is maximum. And so my final statement is when we had the double slit experiment and we had what looked like two patterns, you get that by taking the single slit pattern and multiplying it by the double slit pattern. So the single slit was giving us the big modulation. The double slit was giving us the little ones. Okay, we're past time. Any questions before we call it a day? Or call it a morning because we'll see you all in an hour and a half. Right, it's a more complicated equation. I, I was going to work it out, but we don't have time, right? But you, you take the derivative set equal to zero and you find a more complicated equation for it.